nice to see all of you for our coffee chat for the month of March. I'm super happy to have two of my favorite people here. Uh, well, three, because Shelly's here too. So we always have to say thanks to Shelly uh, for all of her work and getting no due date off the ground. But um, our host and curator, Pete, is here, of course. And we have one of the co-authors of our selection for this month, mm -hmm. Art Carton, um, who co-authored Leave Me Alone and I'll Make You Rich uh, with our friend Deirdre McCloskey. Art, welcome to no due, no due Date. We're really happy to have you here. It is fantastic to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Pete, it's your show. Awesome. I want you guys to have a maximum amount of time to talk to Art um, and raise questions with him on this uh, excellent book. Um, I should point out that Art is a professor of economics at Sanford University, and he's the associate editor of the Southern Economics Journal. Uh, Southern Economics Association is the second largest a uh, professional association of economists in the United States after the American Economic Association. So this is no small, uh, important uh, position to be in. And Art is an economic historian, a, a product of the Doug North uh, School of Institutional and Economic History. And, uh, you know, he, he, you know, this book that we're talking about is uh, an amazing treatise about the history of innovationism and what led to the rise of wealth creation in some societies and the improvement over time. So I just had a few questions that are related to those themes that I hope um, Art might be able to answer and then we'll turn it over to all of you to ask questions. When we get to that point, just use the raise hand function. And if that runs into a problem, just try to grab me on chat. We have people that will be looking at us. Yes, Shelly. Oh, you're showing the raise hand function. Okay. Uh, so, all right. So my first I question part sure. is, first of all, thank you very much for doing this. Yeah, sure. Uh, and my first question is, if you could tell us a little bit about the origins of the project and working with Deirdre McCloskey, who's one of the most important economic historians of the Ever. second half of the 20th century. And <laughs> perhaps the leading classical liberal thinker in the world today. Yeah, that's that's not um, that would not be inaccurate. I know that uh, kind of little inside baseball, like when people talk about possible dark horses for the Nobel Prize, people say if there's another if there's going to be another prize for economic history, it would probably go to, to McCloskey, Joel Mokir and probably Claudia Golden. So yeah. she's uh, I, mean, I mean, she is of the first rank among intellectuals. And uh, I first met Dr. McCloskey at uh, the Economic History Association Conference in St. Louis in 2002. Um, I was a second year grad student at Washington University in St. Louis. EHA was meeting in St. Louis. So of course we all went to the meeting. And uh, it was the first time I met uh, Deirdre, I don't know that we really spent a whole lot of time together. But you know, we would, we'd see each other at conferences again and again over the next several years. And uh, she became a bit of a fan of my popular writing. Um, mm -hmm. She visited Rhodes College, where I was teaching um, in 2009, and she visited, she spent a couple of days there, then we went down to the University of Mississippi. So yeah, we got to be pretty good friends, I guess. Um, where things really got started was in 2005, the weekend before my dissertation proposal, actually, my advisor, John Nye, who's now one of Pete's colleagues at George Mason, asked me to pick her up at the airport because she was gonna present the entire, or she was gonna present the first volume of the Bourgeois Trilogy and watch you. And so, of course, yeah, absolutely. I'll go pick up McCloskey at the airport and, and take her back. And uh, she seemed to be uh, sort of taken aback when I, I said that I'd read the entire manuscript um, in the week leading up to her uh, in the week leading up to her seminar. And I mean, it was it was mind blowing to me just what a what a, a an achievement this was. Yeah. Anyway, long story short, in 2012, we were both in the Competitive Enterprise Institute's little I pencil movie project. They did the filming in Chicago, and I sent her an email. Said, "Hey, let's get together in uh, let's get together and have lunch." And at lunch, she said that she had this idea for a popular-ish version of the Bourgeois trilogy, and wanted to ask if I would co-author it. And uh, yeah, the the answer the answer when Deirdre McCloskey says, "Will you work with me on something?" is absolutely unambiguously, "I will stop whatever I'm doing else and and do it." And that was the origin of the project. So all right, this I'm ad living a little bit, but uh, this is uh, people here might. Uh, uh, I was at a Liberty Fund conference with Paul Hain. I had known mm -hmm. Paul Hain for you know twenty years or so, and I was at a Liberty Fund conference, and we came back, 
And Paul called me on the Tuesday morning to tell me that he had been diagnosed with inoperable liver cancer. Oh, wow. And he asked me if I would take over the economic way of thinking, hmm. you know, wow. in that conversation. So I said, yeah. of course, yes, you know, and then, you know, uh, nature took its course. And then all of a sudden, Prentice Hall contacts me and gives me this manuscript and says, hey, you got to do the new editions of it. And all I kept on thinking for the next six months was all I'm going to do is paint a mustache on a Mona Lisa. How right. the hell am I going to do that? So McCloskey <laughs> has written, you know, probably one of the most sweeping in interactions of, of social science, of history, yeah. of social yeah. theory in general, of the liberal right. enrichment. And then that's given to you to try to do. Did, did you have any trepidation about entering into this? Uh, more than a little bit, actually, because I, I joke about uh, I joke about trying to write the grand unification theory of everything, like the grand unification theory of the social sciences and the humanities. And that's kind of what Deirdre did in the, the bourgeois trilogy. Then she sort of brought me along to to, to synthesize it all and, and kind of put together a capstone project. And at various places, I was thinking that I was thinking I'm, I'm, I am in no way, shape or form qualified to do this. Yeah. Um, I've, you know, I've, I'm reasonably well read by most standards, but not, you know, appointed in an English department as a professor of English uh, standards, like, like, like Deirdre is. Mm -hmm. So um, it was, it was a, it was a heck of a learning experience. Yeah, it is doing amazing. that, and, and it was a very tall order. Amy will get a kick out of this. I've described her trilogy as imagine if Adam Smith had written one book that was made up of the theory of moral sentiments and the wealth mm -hmm. of nations, and then tried mm -hmm. to explain the interaction effect between the two books mm -hmm. and in one, you know, big sweep. Mm -hmm. So and, and, and lectures I, I, on jurisprudence. What? And lectures on jurisprudence. Right. That's that's actually mm -hmm. yes. So Art, my next question is just simply, it's a McCloskey question. Uh -huh. uh, does the past have a useful economics? And how do you see the relationship between economic theory, economic history and economic development as being played out in your work? So it should come as no surprise that I think economic, or I think the past does in fact have really, really useful economics for a handful of reasons. First is because there's nothing new under the sun. Um, everything old is new again. And for all these things that seem like, oh my gosh, we've never confronted a situation like this, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, if, if you really dig into the economic history, it turns out that there are probably a few examples. Um, one of the things I, I was thinking about earlier is that we still read about the history of the Peloponnesian War and not just to show that we're all erudite and things like that. They, they're really serious lessons, I think, from economic history. It's, it's, it's kind of the utmost hubris um, of the economist. And economists, the economists in the room know this, like to, to think, okay, we've got all that figured out. You know, we, we, we don't need to learn. We don't need to go re rehearse the mistakes of others. We can sort of sit down and just give us the right data and the right amount of time and the right dynamic stochastic general equilibrium model. And we can fix everything. And I think that's not a, that's not a good way to do social science. I think digging into digging into the history, not just as a source of data, but in order to try to, to understand the particular circumstances of time and place of mm -hmm. actors in the past facing incentives and uh, budget constraints and things like that, um, I think helps us tell a much richer story about social change. Mm -hmm. With respect to economic development, um, again, I think, and here, here just recent economic history, is really useful because once again, you know, it's arrogant economists kind of sitting in our offices thinking that we're uh, that we can we can plan the world, um, and of course, like uh, randomized controlled trials is like the big thing right now in development economics. But uh, again, one of the things that economic history shows us is that we've tried this and this and this and this time and time and time and time and time and time again. And first of all, like it rarely works. So dumping money on places with foreign aid. It just doesn't work. Trying to giving them capital doesn't really work. Uh, Deirdre criticizes what she calls the World Bank consensus, which is poor institutions and stir. Again, trying to and Chris Coyne has done a lot of really great work on why it's why trying to to create liberal democracy from the ground up doesn't really work. And then it's all it's it's also it's also very condescending, I think, to uh, 
to look at the world, the world in all of its beautiful diversity, and frankly, sometimes all of its horror, but to look at it and say, okay, you know, I, I, I know better than you what should go on in your country, in your land, in your community. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sweep in, I'm going to fly in with all my frequent flyer miles and come into a country where I don't speak the language, I don't know the culture, can't identify the cuisine, and I'm going to fix it all. Um, again, I think that, that history shows us we, um, we don't have a very good track record yeah. with endeavors like that. So one of the things that I really appreciate about volume one mm -hmm. of the Bourgeois Virtues book, uh, a trilogy, mm -hmm. but then also in your book mm -hmm. is the idea that, um, it, 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 and Mulcure stresses this as well, mm -hmm. which is that one of the core enlightenment projects is that, um, you know, progress is, is possible. Yeah. Progress is desirable. Progress mm -hmm. is experienced uh, when we embrace certain values and, mm -hmm. and certain, you know, ideas. And your book does an outstanding job, I would argue, of documenting that. Maybe we can, um, you know, talk about this. But yeah. this is also, as I said, Mulcure has this idea. Yeah. McCloskey has this idea. Obviously, Julian Simon, mm -hmm. you know, had mm -hmm. that idea. Um, at the same time, pessimism seems to constantly right. sell culturally. So why do you think it is that pessimism sells so well when the facts stare us in the face that challenges that pessimism? Yeah, that's a difficult question. And, and one, that, one that I really wish I could answer. It seems like if, if, if we were as scientific as we think we are, or as, sci as scientific as we claim to be, then, then the case would be settled. I mean, the, the, the evidence in favor of, of liberal democratic free market institutions is overwhelming. Um, I mean, it is, it's, it's I, I think, almost impossible to argue that uh, the great enrichment happened because of the great revaluation and this led to massive improvements in, uh, in the human condition. Um, but nonetheless, like pessimism sells for a lot of reasons. And I, I was actually thinking about this earlier because like Pete sent me some of the questions earlier and asked me to, to kind of think about them a little bit. And I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm writing this book with, with, I've written this book with Deirdre McCloskey, who is among other things, uh, appointed in the, in the English department. And my son who's 13 is reading Hamlet in school. So what the heck, let's, it's, you know, it, it, it seems poetically appropriate to, to go to a Hamlet quote. And in, I think it's act three, scene one, uh, Hamlet refers to refers to death or the time after death as an undiscovered country. So I'll quote directly here. It says to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that dread of something after death, the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. And I think the fact that the future, not just death, but the, the future is an undiscovered country. Um, it means that it's a, it's a scary place where there's a lot of uncertainty and we can look at the past and see how things sort of more or less worked out for each of us individually and uh, but confronting the present and confronting the future there's a lot of weird stuff going on that we may not understand that and again I'm going to back, go back to Hayek here that we may not have the knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place in order to deal with and the fact that we the fact that we don't understand it makes it really really scary. It's it's very difficult just to say oh people will figure it out. You know, people are smart or people have you know been managing it. Well, we were talking about Eleanor Ostrom before the uh, uh, before the yeah. before the before the show I guess, and um, you know. People have come up with these these indigenous institutions that have allowed them to manage this common pool resource for millennia. Um, for whatever reason, people just didn't, tend not to be satisfied with that. Yeah. It is a, I don't know. I, I recommend to people, I, have you listened to the, to the latest Glenn Lowry podcast that he did on uh, what's it called? Uh, keeping, keep talking. There's a podcast called keep talking and Glenn Lowry did it. And he, he it's, it's mainly a, uh, very autobiographical so mm -hmm. it's not that interesting unless you're interested in him but at the very end he starts talking about this issue of progress that's been made mm -hmm. and 
the reasons why some you mm. know stagnation has happened or whatever and it's mm. it's a kind of a fascinating story yeah. about how it is that you know um like the way you talk about in the book like the factfulness stuff has just disappeared mm. And, yeah. and one of the things about reading your book, maybe I'm a little bit of a nutter because it connects up to the minds wide shut as well. Um, but I see all of these things as being interconnected with an indictment of the Enlightenment yeah. um, and things that have happened over the last 20 mm -hmm. years in our intellectual culture, which have not allowed us to understand the points, basically, that a Julian Simon was making. Right. right. Uh, or, or to think about another phraseology by, let's say, um, you know, Matt Ridley, right? In Matt Ridley's book on how innovation works, it's a very mm -hmm. Cardin McCloskey point, which is yeah. that, that uh, it, the, uh, innovation is the child of freedom and mm -hmm. the parent of prosperity. Right. And yet that, that I think that phrase is beautiful. I agree. Right? And, and as an economist, I get like whatever the, the, you know, the little warm fuzzies are when I read it. But if my, I told that to my neighbors, I think they would think I was nuts in some sense. Mm -hmm. And it's very weird. Yeah. Well, I, I actually gave a copy of the book to a friend of mine in another department that I have lunch with on, on a pretty regular basis. And he's very skeptical of the liberal project. And I said, OK, well, here's the book. Here's our argument. And, and part of what he said is or one of the <clears throat> excuse me. One of his responses is, well, you know, no one really cares that we're a whole lot better off than we were in 1820. Like, you know, what does that do for like the average person in, uh, you know, say the housing projects, not terribly far from here or something to that effect. Yet, like, I guess, um, uh, I guess it might be cold comfort because you know, one of the, one of the examples we use is the example of Fontaine from Les Miserables. Yeah. And, you know, we, we talk about how, how much better off a female headed household is in Birmingham, Alabama, mm -hmm in the 21st century than Fontaine was, or than the average Frenchman was in 1820. Um, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not really sure why people when confronted with, with the evidence that's out there still tend to dismiss the, the liberal project. Or yeah. another thing that, that I think is really important is with respect to discarding the enlightenment or, or rebellion against the enlightenment, thinking that a lot of the sins of the world are somehow unique to the, to the West and in particular, the post enlightenment West. One of the arguments we make in the book is, is about slavery. And um, of course, there are a lot of people arguing right now that slavery is sort of at the root of modern prosperity and you know, slavery, imperialism, colonialism. These are the things that explain why the West got rich, why whites are rich, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The, the evidence just isn't there. And another argument we make is that if slavery per se, or if just mere exploitation per se, could have created a great enrichment, then it would have happened a really long time ago yeah. somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, Neil Ferguson, as a historian at, uh, at the Hoover Institution, said uh, uh, once said that it, after he said that imperialism is the least original thing Europeans did after 1492. Like right. imperialism, slavery slaughter, killing, horribleness. Like these are things people have been doing to each other since time immemorial. These are not unique. And uh, if they could have created a great enrichment, it would have happened a long time ago somewhere else. Yeah, I love the way that you play off the, <clears throat> you know, in the beginning of the book, you play off the Hobbesian theme mm -hmm. of life being nasty, brutish, and short, and yep. then go through each of those. You yep. know, how nasty was it mm -hmm. compared, right? How yep. brutish was it? How, how short was it compared to today? And, you know, again, like uh, I, this is for a different time and maybe it's a little too insider baseball. But one of the things that has always freaked me out about um, my colleagues in economic history mm -hmm. is the following. I read in the 80s Burzell and Rosenberg's book, mm -hmm. and I read that on the heels of, re, of also or vice versa, Jones's book, The, the mm -hmm. European Miracle. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, which is all about the polycentric nature of Europe and all these things. And if you go back and look at the Burzell and Rosenberg book, they line up all the competing hypotheses, exactly mm -hmm. what you just said. Is it due to slavery? Is it due to imperialism? Mm -hmm. Blah, blah, blah. And all these things like that. And they knock them all down. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And uh, the, the remaining hypothesis is the, the, the basically the competition among the city states and, mm -hmm. you know, and then adopting certain key, you know, institutions, mm -hmm. which I want to come to in my last question yeah. to you. But I keep on asking Koyama and Johnson and everyone mm -hmm. else around me, did Rosenberg and Brazil get refuted? Did Jones get refuted? Is there a refutation mm -hmm. of their argument? And the claim, as far as I know, is no, we just got bored with that hypothesis. And then we went. And so then we have to recreate it again. And, and in many ways, thank God for your book, because you're you're basically revisiting a lot of those hypotheses. So I want to thank you for that. But let's move on, because I want to get to this. Two last sure. questions. Okay. One question is, you are now, because you're a McCloskey co-author, uh, you are now <laughs> in the ideation business. Your yes. thesis at the very end of the book reiterated from the beginning of the book all the way to the end that it's ideas mm -hmm. that change the world. It's not institutions. Mm -hmm. You're also in the North School. Right. So you come out of the North School and McCloskey wants to try to drive a wedge between ideation and, and institutions. Um, mm -hmm. How do you negotiate that in your own head? And uh, I'm self-interested here because... McCloskey is trying to pick a fight with me over my last book and I have to write a response to her and I don't know really how to do it because she's a hero of mine. Right. And, and I agree with her so much, but I don't see these as juxtaposed positions if understood the way I think that right. they should be understood. And you're a better person at this than me. So I want to hear what you have to say. So I can, can rip you <laughs> yeah, off. That's, right answer. Um, yeah. Well, it, and this is so in some sense, like the, the the collaboration with McCloskey is like the the perfect microcosm of the economics profession when it works well, because like we're fighting with, with each other. And yeah, granted, like she's she's in terms of professional stature, she's here and I'm kind of like here. But, you know, still, I, I, I do believe things. And I think there's a lot more consistency between the ideation thesis and the institution's thesis than she claims in. Uh, um, in her trilogy, um, that was that was ground I was willing to give. You know, not a hill I was willing to die on for the uh, uh, for the, for the book as it is. Yeah. But um, I, I think I think there's when, when you think about the way that North defines institutions as um, uh, formal rules, informal norms, enforcement characteristics. That you know, ideas are all over that. And ideas are all over specifically, specifically informal norms part of it. When we think about what is honorable and stuff like that, yeah. Don Boudreau um, talks about what he called the honor tax. That's sort of his McCloskey in point saying, well, the honor tax went down and, and yeah. here, just pick that point up. And I think that that's fundamentally a Northian point that, uh, you know, a reduction in the honor tax leading to, uh, leading to higher, um, leading to higher economic growth is good. I think I think where where McCloskey McCloskey and North really part ways is on the notion that you know countries just have to get their institutions right, and if they get their institutions right, everything's going to be great. And then there's this sort of unspoken unspoken presumption that um, all we need is you know the right people at the World Bank telling benevolent autocrats what to do and then that will create everything i think it's a much it's, it's a much deeper much more difficult much more difficult problem but that's um, much more of an asabogu and robinson thing than it is a north thing yeah and i think that that's probably where her 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 beef yeah. is mostly yeah. it's with asamoglu asamoglu johnson robinson yeah i mean but, they're the they're the it factor people and yeah. so she's yeah. Yeah. all right last well, question but, for me which mm -hmm. is you know, it's been a while since you worked on the book and published the book now. I mean, it, it came out in the middle of a pandemic. So that, yeah. that um, is mean, it keeps it still fresh and everything. But you've had enough right time sales. to have the book out there be discussed by different people. Mm -hmm. Is there any lines of argument that have come from critics uh, that, you know, really uh, piques your interest in which you were trying mm -hmm. to find more persuasive ways to communicate in your continuing efforts? Yeah, so the first is the um, the sort of criticism that McCloskey's gotten for ever and that North, for example, got forever. 
um, from people who said, well, it can't be institutions. It can't be ideas. It's got to be like hard material stuff. Right. It's got to be changes. In, it's got to be changes in factor endowments. It's got to be changes in relative prices. It's changes in relative prices all the way down. And uh, again, like, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. I, I spend, <laughs> I spend an enormous amount of time trying to convince rooms full of students that yes, in fact, people respond to incentives, but People also, people also experiment with new ways of living and with new thing, and with new ways of believing stuff. And sometimes those new ideas stick and sometimes those new ideas reproduce and propagate and um, uh, really, really matter. And again, like we said, are, are sort of the, the, the match that lights the, uh, or the match that, set, that sets the world aflame, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, um, a lot of economists, again, though, think that it's kind of, that's just too squishy. You know, that's too, you know, that's not hard-headed, materialist, realist enough. And then, of course, there are, there are folks I've, I've heard of, you know, from a friend who assigned the book in his class that, you know, McCloskey and I are racists, I guess, because we're, um, you know, we're, we, we don't think that slavery is why uh, Western prosperity happened. And that's a, that, that's a criticism I take much less seriously. Yeah. But um I, I do spend a lot of time actually thinking about how I persuade not so much my economist friends um, why McCloskey and I are right, but how do we how do I persuade people who at a very fundamental level reject the idea that incentives matter, that incentives do matter, that liberty works, et cetera. Yeah. Um... That's awesome, Mark. I think one way to think about McCloskey, and how, how do you react to this, is that a lot of economists, when they're talking about uh, changes in the endowments, changes in relative uh -huh. prices, they're looking at people being able to capture basically the, uh, the uh, gains from trade that haven't uh -huh. been exhausted. So basically, right. some kind of deadweight loss. Uh -huh. And McCloskey and you are making an argument for innovative innovationism, mm -hmm. which means that it's all about the gains come from shifting the supply curve out. Right. Yes. And so that's the yeah. difference in the way that you think about it mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, they want to explain, you know, basically, you know, the, the exchanges within, you know, to capture and you're explaining how it is that the whole new system changes, right? right. Um, yeah, and that's something actually, especially in the second volume of, of the trilogy, Deirdre really digs into um, really digs into these hypotheses and says, you know, so just take free trade, for example. So like we all love free trade right. and McCloskey loves free trade. You love free trade. I love free trade. We're very glad that the world moved toward free trade. Free trade is nice to have, but she argues that this, like this, 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 capturing this deadweight loss that uh, becomes consumer surplus as a result of a move to free trade. Yeah, that's a couple of percentage points right. of what we really want to explain and, and, and say five or six percentage points of a 1600, 1700, 2000 percent percentage point improvement in standards of living is again, nice to have, but it doesn't tell, it, it doesn't tell enough of the story to really be full. Um, and of course, and, and of course, that's something that uh, when I think about criticisms we get, sometimes people say, oh, so you're saying free trade doesn't matter. No, no, we're not saying free trade doesn't matter. Right. We're not saying free trade's not nice to have. It's like, oh, are you saying the railroads and technological, and you're saying science doesn't matter. This is another one I get a lot of pushback on, actually, is science and education. People saying, oh, are you saying science doesn't matter? We shouldn't have more science. No, I'm, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have more science. Um, I'm just saying that your bartender didn't need a degree in chemistry in order to learn how to mix a good Manhattan. Right. And yeah, and, and and moreover, if he goes back and gets a degree in chemistry at the margin, that's probably not going to make his they're probably going to make his drinks that much better. All right, uh, it's wide open. I don't have any more questions. Right. Yes, Ross. Okay. okay. So, uh, Andreas, go ahead. Yes. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the for the conversation. Uh, yeah. Art and so uh, I am in chapter 10, so I'm still, mm -hmm. you know, I, I still have kind of some way to go, mm -hmm. uh, but I am uh, intrigued uh, by uh, some uh, discussion in, in chapter 10 where, mm -hmm. where, where you guys talk about uh, the golden rule, right? And mm -hmm. there are like a couple of go golden rules that, yeah. that you guys uh, mm -hmm. mentioned. So I have kind of two questions about this. Yeah. The, the first one is, 
you know, why is this, why is the golden rule kind of mentioned and, and what is the link between these golden rules and, and the free and the free economy? So, so that's that a really good question. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, and it's something that we spent a lot of time, spent a lot of time thinking about. Because Deirdre and I are both, uh, both, both sort of believing hardcore Christians. She's, uh, she's Anglican, I'm Southern Baptist. Um, so, we, so a lot of this informs the, the work that we're doing. And uh, the, the sort of the weak version of the golden rule is just sort of like the, the libertarian non-aggression axiom, basically. Like, don't do to people what you don't want them to do to you. And that's the leave people alone part. That's the leave me alone part. Um, simply recognizing people's freedom, recognizing uh, people's dignity, that is, um, that, that I would argue is essential. The, the Jesus version of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, I think is, is, is a lot richer in a certain way because it, um, it suggests a lot more agency and a lot more activity on um, our part as people interacting with each other. And here I, I just get kind of, I just get a little bit speculative, but when I think about, okay, what do I want other people to do unto me? Well, okay, I want them to have corned beef at the grocery store on St. Patrick's Day. You know, I want them to have, yeah, I want them to provide electricity for me so I can run my fridge. I want them to, you know, I'm really, really happy when they invent a new coffee maker I can program and then like the coffee starts being made early in the morning. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's something, something that, that's, that's much more active to it. And I think that gets to this, this interaction between economics or between the social sciences and the humanities, where we, we have a, not just liberalism, but a humane liberalism, um, where we're not just saying, okay, we're all going to, well, again, like, like an example I use uh, with my students sometimes, again, at, at a Baptist university, if we think about like, like ways people flourish, okay, how do people flourish? Well, okay, there, there are a lot of things people do um, with their liberty that definitely I would not say counts as flourishing. Um, I, again, have said, we have a lot of students we're trying to get them data analytics internships at different places. If a student got an offer for a data analytics internship from Pornhub, I would strongly suggest they look elsewhere, even though there'd be lots and lots of data, probably lots and lots of money, et cetera, et cetera. I think that, again, this is, this is where we get the, uh, the humane part of the bourgeois deal. Julie. Hi, um, hi everyone. And uh, thanks, thanks Art, thanks Pete. Sure. Thank you. Really, really interesting. I'm, I'm also not all the way through the book. So who knows, maybe my questions is, uh, gets answered in later chapters. There was a couple, of, I'm gonna just sort of give you two quick questions. One is that the tone of the book, it's, it's very provocative. You know, mm -hmm. it's definitely, I can see where you were sort of writing it sort of, you, it feels like you're in, you know, mm -hmm. you're in everyone's face on some of these things, the yeah. title chapters and everything. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if that comes from McCloskey's personality um, it, or, or if that's your personality or, or and, and, and were you doing that, um, I assume to attract a broader audience. And I was mm -hmm. very interested in what Pete was saying given all these facts, yeah. nobody believes any of this stuff. So I think you have to try to write it as a popular book. That, so, that's, so I'm interested to know a little bit more about how the tone came about. But the, the other question I have, because, and you've just hit on it, the one that you get the pushback on science doesn't matter. I mean, I understand what you're saying. It wasn't the primary drive, driver for this increase in, in wealth. But I wonder like today, would you mm -hmm. say that things are different in the world that we live in? You, you gave the, the example of the bartender doesn't need a chemistry degree, but maybe he doesn't want to always be a bartender and right. not have benefits with his job. And maybe he wants to make more than $30,000 a year. So yeah. anyway, um, those are my two points or questions. Yeah, so the tone question, the tone question is, is interesting. Um, I, I can be brusque at times. I, I've been told I try not to be. Um, McCluskey is much more confrontational, I think, though, than I am. And um, you see that you see this a little bit in the Bourgeois trilogy. The, the the tone the tone is very similar. And, and there were there were times when I tried to I tried to make the I, I tried to make the text nicer, without without it losing its voice. And then there are also probably some times when I made I made it probably a little bit sharper than it otherwise would have been. Mm -hmm. But for kind of a for kind of the popular treatment that we're going for. It does have to be a little bit kind of. It does have to be a little bit kind of in your face, 
Um, she's got the whole 1700 pages of the, of the big trilogy with the more nuanced, heavily footnoted argument. Our goal was to write a book that somebody could skim profitably on a flight from Birmingham to Chicago, and then like read carefully on a flight from say Atlanta to LA. And um, that certainly can't be done with the, the big trilogy. And again, we had, to, we had to sacrifice a little bit of nuance, I think, in order to make that happen. Um, as for the importance of science, it's, it's true that, yeah, so the bartender may want a, it's true that returns to human capital have changed a lot. Um, and acquiring scientific or acquiring technological skills might matter a lot, but it is still, I think, less a fundamental driver than market-tested innovation. One of the things that's essential to, to our project is the importance of the market test. Because like anybody can come, up with, can come up with new ideas. Whether or not those new ideas are worth anything is something that people vote for. They vote for with their buying, their buying decisions, their, their abstention decisions, things like that, things that people do in markets. Um, I'm not convinced that the, re that the return on investment in say, for example, government funded science is as high as a lot of people think. And I'll give a personal example, personal example of that. When I was in, uh, gosh, no, 2013, I got to be, I got a grant from the US Department of Agriculture for one of the papers I've written about Walmart. And so instead of teaching principles of macroeconomics online that summer, I spent the summer working on this Walmart research. And we discovered that uh, when Walmart super centers open up, that there's a, there's a causal relationship between Walmart super centers and reductions in food insecurity. And it's not really clear to me that this was of sufficient import to justify taxpayer support. Um, that if this was a thing that at the margin directed me into this line of research, as opposed to just teaching another dozen or so students in principles of macroeconomics, I'm really not sure how that stacks up as a, uh, as a use of resources. Alice? Hey, hi everybody. Uh, thanks so much, Art. Um, yeah, thank you. I really like this pithy writing and I thought it, it was a lot like um, McCloskey's last work of why liberalism works more so than trilogy, all of which I have enjoyed and thought so much about and it's informed well so much of my thinking and teaching and um, yeah. thank you for continuing this. Sure. So like everybody else, it's only halfway through the month so we can forgive ourselves. I'm not done reading this. You introduced in the beginning that you're going to um, talk a good bit about rhetoric. It's something I think about a lot. The word capitalism and its association with inequality and yes. certainly our move toward authoritarian rule across the globe and the need to just get rid of the term. What kind of traction do you see innovism taking and what can we do other than of course using it in the classroom because of how excellent that word is for what it's describing and what the emphasis is yeah the problem with capitalism the word is it's as we explain in the book it's a terrible description of what we actually mean and, and frankly like we don't really think innovism is that much better um but it's at least kind of something it's like capitalism that embraces innovation um yeah you know, rhetorically again you just use the word in casual conversation buy copies of the book for your friends assign it to your students buy more copies of the book for your friends you know stuff like that the paperback's coming out in october um and then i think kind of when people talk about capitalism try to figure out exactly what it is they mean when they say capitalism one of the i'm sure everyone in in, in the chat knows this that like one of the major problems we have in conversation is a lot of conversations aren't actually conversations. People aren't listening as much as they're waiting for their turn to talk. And I've been bad about this. Economists in general are bad about this. Uh, just to use immigration as an example, when someone says they're afraid that the immigrants are going to come and take all our jobs, like I'm prepared with my 12 point refutation of their claim and like why immigrants are the greatest thing in the history of the world. And well, no, I, okay, maybe I need to listen a little bit better. And instead of saying, instead of just leading off with, well, capitalism isn't, we're not talking about what, uh, we're not talking about what advances the interest of capital, just finding out for people, what do they mean when they say capitalism? What do they mean when they say 
socialism. And if they say by capitalism, I mean, you know, I was in a, a not really a debate, but a discussion at my old job um, of capitalism where one of the one of the other participants started off by defining it as a system of social relations based on the exploitation of labor. And I kind of pointed out like that that's pretty useless. Like it, it, no decent person is going to defend that. Um, so it's not really clear that we're using capitalism the same way. Similarly, if somebody, when they say socialism, they mean sharing, or when they say socialism, they mean Sweden, then they don't mean the same thing that, that McCloskey and I especially mean when we talk about, when we talk about socialism. The I left has been I... much, much better about language, or they've been much more successful, I think, with, with defining terms and popularizing different bits of language than we have. And I, I don't know how, I don't know why that is. Art, I think that, Art, I was just going to say, uh, as someone who talks a lot about socialism uh, or spent a lot of time studying socialism when I was younger and now returning to it some, is that I actually think that we let intellectuals off the hook in a way that they shouldn't be allowed to be let off the hook yeah. in the following sense, that precisely because they don't know the history even of development, they don't know the history of socialism. Right. And they yeah. don't understand that the earlier socialists had the same aspirations that they have. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that the tragedy of socialism isn't that it was bastards who wanted to get control mm -hmm. and then they got control and they did bastardly things. It mm -hmm. was that they had these high aspirations of democratic freedoms, of mm -hmm. true freedom to bring to the not bourgeois mm -hmm. freedom, but like real freedom. Yeah. And they ended up enslaving their populations. And mm -hmm. that's yep. the same kind of colorful rhetoric that one listens to today from advocates of democratic mm -hmm. socialism is exactly the same kind of reasons why someone like the Webbs believed in socialism or H.G. Yeah. Wells or any of these other you know, intellectuals at the time. And for that matter, Trotsky. Yeah. You know, or or you know, whatever. I mean, you know, it, it, people forget that the the word Soviet has to do mm -hmm. with actual democracy. Mm -hmm. It's workers' democracy. That's what they were trying to achieve. And so I, I, I agree with you that, that people don't mean by it Stalinism. Mm -hmm. Right. And then when you, but they, but they don't see that Stalinism was not the original goal to begin with. It's right. a byproduct, an unattended, mm -hmm. undesirable consequence of a system yeah. that cannot work. And yeah. uh, and learning that lesson is is not as as difficult to communicate as the lesson that you're trying to communicate about factfulness. Mm -hmm. Just literally getting the facts yeah. right about human history is problematic. Yeah, I, I've, I kind of have a hypothesis that um, if you change all of his, or, sorry, if everything in history is the same except that except that Trots, Trotsky doesn't die and it ends up being Trotsky rather than Stalin. Communism still would have failed, and the apologetic today would be, well, if only Stalin had been the one in charge. That's Rather right. Rather than this, this SOB Trotsky, it would have yeah. been it would have been something very, very different. So that's um, the power, by the way, of Orwell, which Amy, yeah. uh, we're not reading Animal Farm, but that would have been a good a good book to actually read and debate. But anyway, uh, Taylor. Hi. Um, thanks, Art, for doing this. Hey. Yeah. Um, I'm kind of going pessimistically going back to that comment about pessimism and picking up on something Alice said, like, but what more can we do to kind of get the message out? Am I, am I clear? Can you hear me? Yeah. Sometimes my mic is not that great. Um, and I'm also thinking about your comments about teaching your students. I, I think one thing that makes me feel pessimistic is that it's, it seems like it's very hard. Uh, it's a lot of work to get people to understand this argument. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an argument that, I mean, I'm not an economist, I'm not an academician. I first kind of encountered this in uh, a book I read a couple of years ago, uh, Suicide of the West with Jonah Goldberg. But yep. I think you mm -hmm. quite a bit about this. Mm -hmm. um, we just did a VRG on a, a virtual reading group on uh, Schumpeter and capitalism, socialism, democracy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of talk about innovation. Um, it's not just that we have to get these ideas across the people who are skeptical, um, it's that we have to get them across over and over. It's like what, when Reagan said, uh, you know, we can lose liberty in the generation. Yeah. It's, it's the argument that has to be won over and over again. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's to me is, is the challenge. 
And I wonder if you think that um, this idea of the 3,000% increase in standards mm -hmm. of living, um, the great enrichment, um, is, it, is it getting across? It, it, do you see signs that people are beginning to understand this? Idea? Um, as, as part of, as part of a, right. bar, a broader uh, argument of, of capitalism versus social. Yeah. Um, my students seem to grasp it a little bit. Some people I talk to when I go and give public lectures, they seem to grasp it you know, at least a little bit. Um, the, the hard selling point, you know, the, the, sell, the selling point for this needs to be, and Deirdre and I try to make this point, uh, that it's not what this does for the Queen of England. It's not better silk stockings for the Queen of England. It's better silk stockings for factory girls for progressively less and less and less and less and less and less effort. Um, <clears throat> Where, when I do think about like the success of the communists, they seem to be very, very good at, at identifying, like identifying the, the, the nodes where public opinion could change and attacking those. And I don't know that our, our side, so to speak, is really that good at it, um, in part because I, I just don't think we're very good at conspiring. Um, I am trying, though, to find ways to make, to make the argument um, accessible and amenable to what I guess what you call thought leaders. So I'm thinking about pastors specifically. Um, a, a lot of kind of economics and Christianity books that I've read are more kind of you know, rah-rah capitalism and not really, kind of, don't really get to the depths that, that I, I would like to see. So I've, I've had, for years, I've, I've told myself I wanted to write a book called Mere Economics. That would basically be, you know, this plus C.S. Yeah, Lewis. Right. Yes. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I'm optimistic a little bit there. Uh, when I when I think about the intellectual elite, I'm incredibly pessimistic because the intellectual elite has been we, we've hated capitalism and we've hated innovism for for millennia. But when I see the fact that you know the most popular majors on campus are things like business and economics, and when people go to college, they like they just want to get a decent job, like they want to be decent people with decent jobs doing decent things. That makes me that makes me a lot more optimistic. Um, one, one more point: my wife's sure. a school teacher and has been for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we're ever going to succeed at, 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 I guess, promulgating these values uh, that underlie capitalism um, without the education to back them up. No, um, because we're and we're not doing a very good job of it. And I think as long as the schools are basically run by the government, we're not going. To. Mm -hmm. Well, so this is where uh, Pete's colleague uh, and like someone I really look up to, Brian Kaplan, has, has made, I think, a good point. Um, for social change, like find the things the government does poorly and do them better. And I think education is education is very much at the top of that list. Um, you know, if, if I want if I want to get sort of political and revolutionary and things like that, like if, if our kids had to go to Birmingham City Schools, we would not live in the city of Birmingham. Um, and that that is that is a that is that is a cause for which I would, which I've said before, I might be willing to take a bullet. Um, uh, I don't think that, I don't think that public schools can be reformed. I am, one thing that actually makes me a little bit optimistic is, is that people are sort of seeing the, that they're seeing the, the, that the emperor has no clothes as a result of the COVID pandemic. Um, um, schools run by the government staying closed for long periods of time schools that are not opening up and more more parents and more families starting to look for starting to look for options starting to look for uh for educational alternatives um i think the quality the quality of the education that my kids are getting at, at like a local private unaccredited community school is is orders of magnitude better than what i would expect them to get somewhere like again in in, in sort of your normal city school and my 13 year old's reading John Stuart Mill with a philosophy professor. I mean, it, that, that's not going to happen in a lot of other places. Ryan? Yeah, I was interested about what you had to say about measurement. Mm -hmm. uh, when people debate public policy, they usually have numbers they can talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, when people talk about institutions. That's tricky, mm -hmm. but you have economic freedom, the world, and other indices. Right. You can mm -hmm. compare how different institutions perform. But your argument, Deidre's argument about culture and public opinion mm -hmm. and rhetoric, 
a lot of that defies measurement. Um, yeah. And my question is, uh, to the extent that these things are at all quantifiable, or is there, uh, is there any movement in the economic discipline towards recognizing that somehow incorporating that to economic thinking? The only example I have handy that I can think of off the top of my head is Jerry Muller's uh, tyranny of metrics. Is there anyone else roughly allied with that line of thinking? Um, well, yeah, I think a lot of you know, a lot of folks in the circles in which Pete and I travel are are a little bit skeptical of, of model and measure as the end all and be all of, of economic science. There are a lot of things that can be measured, things like the World Value Survey. Uh, I'm, I'm actually kind of optimistic about digital humanities with respect to, in particular, using things like Google, Google n-grams or uh, Google Trends data to try to suss out exactly what's being said, how it's being said, where it's being said, why, um, it, putting a, at least a little bit of, of quantitative heft onto, uh, onto some of these things. So I think it, it can be done. I mean, we probably, I don't know, we probably should have used some of the world value survey data in looking at what we were, looking at what we were doing. I've, I've got a, a rough draft of a paper that's been in my filing cabinet for ages on regulation. And in fact, actually I presented it to George Mason in 2018 at a conference and then it's just been sort of sitting but i looked at, at trends in the number of people who like the number of degrees in public administration being granted and degrees in things like business things like engineering etc so um in fact actually it occurs to me as a result of your question what i should probably do is take that and and like categorize categorize degrees in the national in, in the from the national center for education statistics there's things like bourgeois degrees uh, bohemian degrees, uh, and probably something else that begins with B, um, as, as another one, but yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So our, one down. of the things yeah. that Genskow and Shapiro did was they use machine learning to scrub mm -hmm. the congressional record. Mm -hmm. It would kind of probably be, you could probably do that with a project where, you know, again, like the way that you think about the mm -hmm. bourgeoisie as, being yep. a co at what Boudreaux calls an honor tax, right? Which yep. is that, you know, what we consider to be honorable. I mean, this was originally what Deirdre was supposed to do in volume three, right? Mm -hmm. Which she was supposed to measure much more mm -hmm. the rise of the respect of the, of the mm -hmm. ordinary give it a go. And yep. she makes that argument, but she doesn't really measure it. Like, you yep. know, and, and so that's the dissertation to be written, right? Mm -hmm. That's the dissertation yep. written. Yeah, and I, I think wanted to say one thing about your uh, your mere economics because I'm very excited about that. My my undergraduate teacher, I went to Grove City College, and my mm -hmm. undergraduate teacher Hans Senholtz very much strongly always stressed about being able to communicate with the preachers on Sunday so that mm -hmm. they could, you know. So I was I was introduced to that, but I I I you know am educated in you know, the secular humanist world after mm -hmm. Grove City, and I have adopted those values. And so my idea is, you know, I want to influence the New York Review of Books or something like mm -hmm. that, which is, you know, climbing up a, 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 a you know, a hill that, that is really yeah. difficult. But one of the things that I've been thinking about in relationship to the last few years is that we really do need full-throated defense of mm -hmm. economic science, yep. okay, and of the liberal project. Mm -hmm. But we really need a defense of economic science against the critics of economics, yes. some of whom practice their economics at MIT or Berkeley. Mm -hmm. yes. So it's, it's not like, but, but you know, the, and, and so here's my question to you. So that's my statement. So here's my question, which is, um, yeah, and, and, I, and I think that you appreciate this like I do as well, is that um, Milton Friedman had a very unique cultural position mm -hmm. yeah. because he was both an it factor in economic science yeah. and also probably the best public intellectual in economics that ever existed, right? Yeah. And so do we need another Milton Friedman? Is that what's necessary? Or, <laughs> it is, hurt. or is it that we have so many so many avenues now, maybe a Milton Friedman can't be, you know, the way it was back in 50 to 1980, let's say. Yeah, I don't know. Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman might be kind of a, you know, he's, he's, he's a black swan. 
in a sense. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not sure, obviously like having another Milton Friedman would help. I'm not sure if there's anything systematic or systemic that is preventing the emergence of another Milton Friedman. Um, I'm not sure like what convex combinations of people who are actually out there could sort of replicate Milton Friedman. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's, there's work to be done defending economics, defending economic science, and then also defending, defending the liberal project. Yeah, public intellectual work, as you well know, is, is generally looked down upon in, uh, in the economics profession. And then you know, economists suffer from the fatal conceit. Uh, a lot of stuff like in reading, looking at the latest issue of the American Economic Review, we are, it, it seems like we're, we're jettisoning theory and pretending to be driven only, only, only by data. But frequently it looks like a lot of those data exercises are things that we kind of really wish were true. Yeah. And uh, it, just the minimum wage literature, I, I think is, is, is sort of a perfect example of this. Inequality. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like a lot of, I think a lot of economists are like ideologically predisposed to want the minimum wage to work. And uh, the whole, like the, the whole reaction to Card and Kruger, um, their famous paper in the mid 1990s has been kind of, uh, you know, an exercise in confirmation bias. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, you're doing a tremendous job in communicating to people the basic facts mm -hmm. of, human history. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that's really fascinating to me uh, was your choice not to mm -hmm. pick the less than $2 a day data. So when you mm -hmm. were adding up and doing the comparisons, right? So mm -hmm. we normally like me, you know, so we're talking about comparative mm -hmm. things in yep. classes. When I talk to my development students, I use the less than 10% for the first time in human history in 2015. Mm -hmm is the first time in human history less than 10% of the world's population was living on less than $2 a day. You mm -hmm. pick a higher rate and then yeah. show the numbers. Is, there, is, mm -hmm. is that because of the point you were making earlier that when you point out that less than 10% are living on less than $2 a day, people are like, but how about the guy living on $3 a day? That's pretty miserable still, right? Uh, we, we're not that clever. Um, oh. I think, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think we really, I don't think we really, we didn't spend a whole lot of time kind of talking, I guess, about which specific measures of extreme poverty we wanted to use. We just kind of, kind of took some stuff off the shelf. Yeah. And it, uh, it, yeah, yeah. It is still an amazing thing yeah. what has happened oh, yeah. in the yeah. last 50 years. I try to, to stress that to my students, but I have the impact of a, of a soap bubble. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, yeah. um, but Art, thank you very much. This thank is a you. great book. Many people are still sure. going to be wrestling with it uh, for mm -hmm. the rest of the month. And then we'll get together and, and have another conversation about it. But I really appreciate you taking the time sure. this afternoon to talk to us. Awesome. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I had a really wonderful time. And yeah. uh, interesting, you mentioned Hans Senholtz. I, I, I've actually been thinking about something you said about Hans Senholtz a long time ago, how he had talked about. I guess, uh, like, go to, go to an institution, spend your entire career there and just change the place from top to bottom. Yeah. I've been thinking about that as, as, as a career strategy, so. Yeah. Cool. Well, I just want to reinforce one line that Art put out, which is, uh, buy this book for your friends, assign yes. it in your classes, yes. uh, talk about it and review it, because as Art and, and Deirdre talk about in the book, uh, you know, uh, the factfulness idea just recognizing that and getting yourself familiar with our world and data and and mm -hmm. all of that is fundamental to our ability to use reason and evidence to counter the uh, emotional mm -hmm. orgy that currently dominates <laughs> our intellectual culture yep better yet pete they should get no due date subscriptions for all their friends yes they should. yes yes we're not we're not announcing what our next book is yet right uh, well, we did at one point. Okay. Well, we'll hold off. Does anybody until... remember? Free to choose, right? Yeah. yeah we're returning to the classic. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. Free to All choose. Right. So. Yeah. We'll, we'll be back to a classic next month. And uh, I don't think we told them past that one. We Maybe one more, but that, that'll be April. So um, as Pete said, we'll have our virtual salon later this month. I'll get that information out to our email group um, the first part of next week. And until then, 
I wish you happy reading. We thank you for coming and we love spending this time with you. Thank you. Oh, one other thing. Uh, pick out your favorite passages and put them up on, on social media. I think that one of the things that Art and Deirdre did was they have amazing turns of phrases <laughs> at different points that are very quotable quotes, which is a really good thing for a book. And I wish I had the ability to have quotable quotes. So I think there's like quotes for the day that uh, I might start posting around. I send them to my colleagues. Uh, and, and All right. There that, we go. But, yeah, so. I will take that, pick up that challenge as well. All right. All right thank you very everybody. much.